take you through some graphics. Uh, adventures in logo design. One code is pain is your game. Now just make sure you have that off you. So in that direction. Okay, hello, welcome. Everyone's awake, at least more awake than I was, so that's good. Now given, oh, thanks for LCA for having us and especially here in lovely Victoria. I found I was welcomed by even the soda here, so that's great. Now, before we get going, I just wanted to throw out a couple caveats. Number one, I am not a lawyer. This is important in one main regard is that in open source and a lot of things you try to avoid the need for a lawyer or entanglements or something like that. However, when you come to the, oh, especially open source pro projects with your logo, trademark is one thing you should try to care about. Uh, even with Linux, Linus has the name Linux watched. Otherwise, people might be running away from it, do bad things. So for those issues, find yourself proper legal representation to assist. Uh, there are several umbrella organizations who can <laughs> okay, who can help with such things and you can avoid a lot of headache in uh, at least the near term. And if, even if you don't hit a lawyer up front and have the chance for that, just keep in mind the need so you keep records and trails clear so when it comes time you can say oh yes these are the three people who were involved let us get together make sure everything's all clean and agreed upon and there aren't any surprises now of course the other big caveat anyone know what this is yes I am not an artist I'm not a professional practicing artist and this does make a difference because as with any skilled trade if you aren't actively practicing you just don't have quite as much so that's important. Seriously. I'm not, you know, I've been out of it so long. I, give me extra time, I can get back up, I can do charcoals and all, I can do stuff if I'm up to speed. But I'm not good with all those mixed media anymore, I'm out of practice, because the computer has now made it easy for me to do what I need to do. So with all that aside, moving on to where we are going to be Fun little adventure, hopefully it will get you started to move forward and either yourself or some people you're associated with or you can assist move forward. Uh, the general layout for this session is going to be to cover some of the design with some overviews, some examples, some examples mentioned but not shown because there are some bad things that accidentally happen in logo design and we just don't want to have any worries there. Then we can also have a good overview of some of the design concepts and logo especially what factors might be pertinent and then sprinkle throughout and then the practice is going to be both how an individual would put this into practice and a little more of maybe you actually practicing if you have anything to mind or any of that so it's going to be a little mix of both of those and that and hopefully by the end you'll be able to know where to go for information, what to look for, even if you don't feel you got a handle on too much of it, hopefully by the end you'll have enough familiarity to be able to go out and web search and drill down on the aspects you do need to get moving forward. So moving forward into the initial section, design. I'm going to give an overview and some examples and hopefully we'll get going Oh, by the way, if you have questions, try to hold off a little. They might be answered, but since th this is such a long and hopefully interactive session, we can try to collect uh, questions as they come up maybe near the end of us each slide or before I move on. I'll try to check. But if you have something, let me know and we'll try to bring those together. So the first question is, what is design? Well, in this concept, I, I think simplicity is best. So the one definition I found was to plan and fashion artistically or skillfully. And for me, the saving grace here is the or. <laughs> Meaning, regardless of how much natural born talent I may or may not have, if I understand the processes and the tools and the application and I practice in those skill sets, 
I can become a skilled practitioner. Maybe not a gifted or talented, but that, that is really something that can be done. And I've had a uh, ver re-verified with someone just this morning who had a uh, arts masters in certain areas and other things who really believes anyone can learn to draw. It's just a matter of practice. And I think back, um, I have to instill in my own children a little more, but back to the, all the good scientists and naturalists of the, uh, the past couple centuries, drawing used to be essential. And so the idea that maybe a scientific bent to your brain means you can't draw, ridiculous. You can. Just needs practice. So when it comes to examples, I'll show, throw out a few but then you can go and search uh, your favorite web search mechanism to discover more at your appropriate level of comfortableness and filtering because some of them are intentionally bad, some of them are just accidental. But you get good examples, you get bad examples, and then of course there's always the ugly. <laughs> and if you're just starting out in this area, any first efforts are going to fall into that last category. So. You know, just you know, it gets better. You just have to keep moving and refining and get feedback. So, let's start now with just a couple of the good examples. I randomly picked a few that I personally like, and I'll go over and point out which they are and a little after of what maybe makes them good. These, though, I think are a few good examples. Not too many. I wanted wanted you to be able to see them, of course. Does anyone recognize that first one? Yes. The Nike swoosh, trademark of Nike. Um, then you have UPS who redesigned their logo not too long ago and I really like the way it turned out. It's not, not overdone, modernized it. HP's, I, I've seen that all over on even boxes today wandering around, that really works. Oh yeah, I haven't caught up with all those. I'm talking about boxes physically laying around now, today. So if there's more in the pipeline, that corporations do do that over time. IBM, they've refined theirs a few times, but that's generally a very recognizable logo. And of course, what, anyone know what the one in the middle is? Inkscape. Inkscape, good, okay. Because I'm involved in this, and if it didn't look good, I would have said something, so I think it's a good logo. And the guys we had working on it, I did not design it, I gave feedback, I participated in it, but I did not actually draw it nor refine it. This is actually a redesigned logo, very much like the UPS, where it was given some dimensionality, some craft, some feel, some depth to it. Very similar in that regard. But still, there's a few things about the design that hold up. One, and we'll get to them in the principles, but just to look, you know, you can recognize it's not too complex, it's easy to spot, it's memorable, and then it tells, ex it shows you exactly what product it deals with, right? Yeah. No. And we'll, we'll get into that a little more. Now, bad examples I mentioned, <laughs> the, the bad, the ones you don't, don't want to replicate, problem is most are inappropriate. Could have been, some might have been okay to present, some maybe not, and so here at the conference I just decided, you know, I won't physically show you them. You can go out and look for some of these yourself and decide, but they, they boil down a lot to the accidentally inappropriate. When you draw some, you can search for bad loco and image search especially, and you'll see these. They are everywhere. They are amusing, people love them. Uh, I put up one main link that shows a few of the example, so you can get, but this one wasn't too bad, so it was like, okay. Uh, and there's at least one on this page that I think there is no way the graphic designer drew it without knowing what he was doing. Others, maybe they didn't know. Uh, another minor thing is some certain logos could be culturally inappropriate. Not anything bad or against, but just culturally insensitive. To in one area or another, and especially with the internet and the web and open source, we want to be respectful of that and try to get some global feedback because most everyone in this room is dealing with global issues, even if you're just one guy typing code into RCS manually, which one of the developers I know does that. Hey, works for him. Now, so what makes a bad example? When you go to look at some of these or see some or get pointed out, 
there are certain things you draw one way that somebody else will perceive differently. And you have to be extra careful here because even if it's very much not what you drew, the human brain is really, really tricky and loves to play with you. There's a classic illustration. Can anyone tell me what this is? Just a quick shout out, throw up a hand. Okay, is it a rabbit? Raise your hands. Two, three, five. Okay, is it a duck? Eight, you know, six think it's a rabbit, eight thinks it, think it is a duck. It's more anatomically correct rabbit than it is a duck. But keep looking at it. Does it stay the animal you thought it was? One of the tricks, it starts to shift, and for many people, it even gets to the point where their brain can't cope with it enough. Any, anyone here see Paul Fenwick's keynote? Your brain is just messed up. This is one of the things that's tied in with that. Some people, it evolves so much that they can no longer see the shapes, they just see lines, and their, their brain just refuses to process. Uh, there's another classic example, a Rubin vase. Here's an example from Wikimedia Commons which is a wonderful source. I'll touch on a little bit of why and what you want to do in practice there later. But as you can see, this generally tends to shift also. So things you have can shift in appearance and play with you. So even if you tried to draw a vase, you might actually end up with faces. You know, if you're tricky, you'll get a few intentionally just to make people look at your logo and point it out on blogs and everything. That's a different issue. But beyond that, there's another thing that happens, in, especially in bad logo designs, is that sometimes your brain will see things that don't exist. Like here. How many triangles are on the screen? Just hold up your hands. One if it's one triangle, or two if you see two triangles. People are seeing two. There is physically only one triangle here. But. But, well, a chopped up, mostly triangle, but then the negative space your brain fills in, and sometimes that makes it more dominant, that the nothing suddenly is a triangle, even though it's not really, maybe, sort of, I don't know. So that's another thing. Even if the, there's something in your drawing, no, even if there's nothing in your drawing, nothing at all that could be a problem, the brain might put something in. And it might depend on what people are used to seeing. And so in a different region, other peop different people might see different things. So just be careful. Uh, ugly examples. Well, the other thing I don't want to violate conference uh, standards, which is you know, very considerate of people. This one is just me personally. I do not want to make you ill or upset from seeing ugliness. <laughs> But if you want to, you can go find some. One of the best summaries, because they have a whole bunch of quick little blobs, blurbs, little ones, and the descriptions saying why they don't like it is yourlogomakesmebarf.com. It's, it's gone stagnant the last year or so, but still, it, it's good for an o o overview, because if you run through these, even though it's kind of silly and fun, it's kind of like lolcats or anything else, going through these places, doing the web searches, and seeing far more seeing there far more than I could show you in the, just the time we have here and at later times and refreshing that will help you get a feel for what not to do. But I have on my target I will be showing you one bad logo. Number one example. Right? Okay. <laughs> Linux. So can anyone here tell me what the Linux logo is? Hey, you're a penguin? Anyone else? Black text with a red R. Let's see. Yep. You say, someone said penguin, which is this guy? Eh, wrong answer. <laughs> and here's the key. Here's the important thing. He is a mascot, not a logo. There is a difference. There is an important difference. There, well, there are many, many, many important differences, but it does make a difference to a designer. So. You have that as a factor. Uh, basically, as far as published information that's easily recognizable is found, there is no Linux logo. The Linux name is a registered trademark, but there is no actual logo that is brought up. And that's why it's a bad logo. Because there is none. There is nothing that you can instantly recognize and say, yes, that is Linux. You know, the mascot helps sometimes, but sometimes he's not appropriate. IBM 
IBM's logo is used all over in their marketing, very recognizable on their machines, all over the place. You know what that is. Linux? Well, there's the word. Did you want to wait questions at the end? Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. a couple of them right now. So the word is registered, but you know, per se, logo per se, maybe not. And there are things that it can do to help you. So now, before we move out of that quick scattering of examples and some bad stuff and thinking of tux, uh, as we're about to move into some of the concepts involved, any quick questions? Yes. yes. Are you saying then that something that is easily used in another fashion, so like a penguin could be, a, could be Linux, but it could also just be a penguin, mm -hmm. it could be a toy, whereas a logo is something which is distinctly different to everything mm -hmm. else, which you can then say can only represent mm -hmm. one thing? Well, the question was about is it the penguin just too generic and can be used for all sorts of things and not a logo, and a logo is very specific? No, actually, in general, a penguin could be the logo. Uh, if it was appropriate, and there's going to be some breakdown of that, but there are certain things that makes the difference, and that's good. So what is the difference between these, and why, and well, between what? What, what are we talking about here? I've mentioned the word logo. I've mentioned the word mascot. So that moves us on into the next point here of end products. Now, oh, by the way, I forgot to check at the beginning. Are there any actual designers here? who have a degree in design or who are professionally practicing in design. Okay, forgive me, don't yell anything, this is not to you. I'm mangling everything, but this is, this is the baby steps to get them headed towards your direction. Okay, so as we're looking over this, the end products, you want to keep, probably keep in mind three main end products you want to end up with, possibly. Any one or more of these, you have logo, you have mascot, you have icon. These can be very, very different. These can be the same. It depends. So logo is going to be something that represents your product, your identity, your, no, not your products per se. Your identity, your brand, your company. Uh, in our open source world, you don't often get company per se. You might get a, uh, might get a .org or something like that, but only in support of it more often than not. So it's more about your project. But think of company. Think of it, you're a company that doesn't deal any money, but only in good and helping mankind. Okay, so the logo is, represents your company or project. The mascot helps, he supports, he can do things. The logo, though, is going to be trademarked. That's the important one, necessarily. And when you have a logo, when it is going to be trademarked, you have to be very careful how it's used, not to allow anyone to use it in an unallowed, a misallowed way, you know, so there's fair use that you can, people can cite it, but you don't want them to abuse it because then it becomes diluted and not useful and there's all sorts of other legal issues, but for, from the design perspective, you want to have it, this is how it's presented. It is in these colors, never like this. It is in, has this much clearance around it. We never combine it with other graphical elements, things like that. It needs to stand off and by itself and we'll go into a little more principles on that. Mascot, tux, He's a good one. Sousa has the uh, chameleon. I forgot his name offhand. Hmm? Is it chameleon? Yes, chameleon. I think it's called Geeko. Geeko, the chameleon, yes. Um, and Red Fedor, Red Hat, they have their properties. They, they watch a little more carefully, and their tux is just out there for random abuse. And some of the, some of the penguins, I think the penguin, uh, the shiny, rounded, glossy penguin that shows up for certain distros showed up at my gro corner grocery store on the box of cereal. You know, I guess uh, open source wasn't doing it for him. He had to get a day, day job, so <laughs> you know, that happens. And then an icon. Specifically, I'm thinking program. So you know, the little thing that lives in the dock that when you bring it up, when you alt tab, you'll see that. That. That is an icon. That is going to be specific to a prog maybe a program, maybe a variation for a couple programs. They might share a single icon or a varied icon. Icons are a magical art all to themselves. An icon artist is someone special. It takes a practice and skill to get into doing that that is slightly different. 
there are some common things, but also you don't have to worry as much about some of these legal issues, some of the use issues, because you want, you want your icon to go tiny, scale up huge, be used all over the place. It, it's something different because it represents your, your actual product, your software, your system, where, and when it's running on a computer. Whereas a logo, that's your brand, that's your marketing, that's your promotion. And if you were in Bruce Perrin's keynote, he touched on that we have this need to really reach out to other people, building up a strong brand. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of engineers think marketing is a dirty word, but Linux is far, and open source in general, is far more capable than most commercial products out there in the field, well, a lot, in a lot of areas. If not, it's viable as an alternative, but the people aren't getting it. What's missing? Marketing. So you need your logo to promote your brand, so when people see that, they know and they know what to do. Now, we're going to move into the process. How do you design a logo? Well, I don't know. It's important to have a process. It's important to figure it out, to work it out, to get what works for you. Many processes can be unique per designer. So if you go out there and ask graphic designers, you'll see different variations on this. If you go to Wikipedia, just look up design, they have a breakdown of like three stages that really usually cover these steps, or they say these three stages and then often broke down, and it will be something similar to this. This is just, I, I found one that I liked that I thought was close, and went with it, and refined a little on my own. But this pretty much covers what you want to do. A design brief, this is what we're going to do. We are setting forth to go here. This is what we can make. Why, who it's going to talk to, you know, things like that. Research and brainstorming, you, you want to go and find out what's going on in your industry or the areas that you'd overlap, what other groups and organizations and corporations are doing, some rough ideas, what idea do you want to promote? What visual way might you be able to promote it? What style do you want to go for? Uh, sketching. As a designer, this, that's going to be the hard thing. No, that you have to all go and draw a whole bunch of things. Even if you can't draw, start, keep drawing over and over and over. Then prototyping and conceptualizing. You actually refine some of you, you, you some of your rough ideas. You pull together, and you have to refine it. Iterative process over and over. Get feedback. You need to avoid the bad logos, <laughs> the accidentally inappropriate, especially. And if you're the only one who's looking at it, no one's going to tell you that that camel's nose is not really a nose. <laughs> okay. And send it out to review. So this, if you're doing a logo for somebody, you send it off to the client. Sometimes you, in open source, you'll be the client. But think of that process. If you break it down this way, even, even if you're, you're, the, you're the customer and the person delivering it, if you think in these stages, it can help you organize and move forward. Revise and polish, pretty self-explanatory. Then deliver and support. This is the one where you've got it, everyone's okay, you send it out to your mailing list, everyone says, yeah, yeah, oh, okay, tweak that, tweak that, okay, you've done everything. Then you package it up in the appropriate formats, put it up there, you have your wiki explaining here are our logo, here are the guidelines, here's what you should say, here's how you can use it, here's how you cannot use it. You'll make it simple and clear and easy to follow, put it out, but then, as people try to use it, they're going to hit problems. You know, they, when they go to the print house, they need some different variation or too many colors or too many control points in the outlines. I don't know. So support. You're going to have to, like any software, maintain it over time, eventually bringing it up. So with that big dump, <laughs> and again, at the end, I have several resources linked, and they have breakdowns of this. There was one blog that had his process and then one big entry on each step to further explain. So there you can go back and get more detail. And remember that each individual designer has a slightly different process. So what they're doing doesn't have to be what you do. Find what works for you and what works for your mind. So then we're going to go back to where I said I'd break down what makes a good logo or what factors should go into making of a good logo. So we're going to have some principles of design. 
Number one, keep it simple. What does simple mean? Well, I have a quick, I have a quick illustration of simple. What's that? Elephant. Elephant. Simple. Well, or Africa, or jungle. Or, or, I don't know. Okay, it starts to get bad. There. What's that? Elephant. <laughs> Very simple. Um, that's just a rough version of something I doodled in one of my cartooning classes. Uh, ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you have to refine it. Feedback, all that, yes. Um, also, if I have my tablet configured and set up well and I have a little, take a little time on it, I do a little better. If I'm using an actual ink pen with a nib and a dip, dip ink, that comes out really well because you can get, if that's how you draw, you can draw better that way. If not, do something else. But the, the point here is that you have the same idea and you want to get simple. Now there's another thing about simple here. Who here is an artist? One, 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 two, okay. Who here has ever heard of the game Pictionary? Yeah, uh, most of you. So you draw, you split up in teams, you draw something on the board and your teammates try to guess what it is you're drawing. Number one, never play Pictionary with an artist on your team. They will do this. They will take forever and you will not know what it is they're trying to get. You want someone who can't draw, who will just do that, and you'll go elephant and win the round. That's the exact concept you want to get here. With a logo, <laughs> that's what you get. Uh, another thing you need to do is make it memorable. If you look at it and you don't remember whose it is, what it is, it might be interesting, but if it's not memorable, it's not a good logo. You're dead. There's a bit more than that, and you should look in but, and think about this and everything else. Because what you want to do, like a commercial, you might remember some of the really funny commercials on TV, but if they don't connect you some way to what they were trying to sell you, they're not a good commercial, even if they're funny and enjoyable. You want to make it timeless. This is a good one. Do not do the latest trend, because in five years it will be so ugly and you will be the laughing stock. Don't do what everyone else is doing right at that moment. Classic, timeless, and think, when we're doing things, start thinking like, how old is Linux now? Anyone? 20 years for some punk kid student's little side project. You don't think at the time that any of this is going to be around that long, but before you know it, things are going. And having a con your logo consistent over time lets people understand, recognize your brand, come back to you, they recognize, oh, it's them, like Wikimedia or Mozilla Foundation, something like that, where they kn people know, start to recognize, and it doesn't get changed every season like you know designer clothes. Definitely don't want that. Versatile. It means you need to be able to use the logo in many different ways, packaging branding, t-shirts, banners, little tiny cups. It needs to work in all those different contexts and on different colors. Sometimes you'll have a dark background, someone will have time, it will have a light background. If you don't think of this up, up, up front, you're going to have some problems. Also, being versatile, you're going to have to be able to use it and make sure it is usable in many different contexts. And then there's a, another point that's somewhat similar but a little different. Before that, though, is appropriate. Whatever you do, you do not want to have a logo that is not appropriate. If you're having a child-oriented product, Kid Tux Paint is a very good one. It's a version of a paint program for children. It makes funny sounds when you play with it. It's really fun. They have a very childish-looking logo, which is perfect for them. IBM, on the other hand, they're big, serious corporate stayed, everybody wears suits even now, and their logo is very appropriate to that. It looks slightly outdated, but only in, in the, out, only, it's pretty good, in, I think, in the way that it's outdated, like it's established, conservative, functional, does the job. It's not dinosaur kind of outdated. And then the variation I mentioned on versatile, specifically, is scalable. And that's where you really have to consider it's going to go on the top of a soda lid. It's going to go on a banner. It's going to go projected on the side of a building, if you're good. 
if it, if it catches on. You know, your logo needs to be scalable. So first of all, your design has to handle being really, really big and really, really small. A few other things, and of course, when it comes to the technical aspect of how do you make it scalable, uh, the W3C did this thing called scalable vector graphics that Inkscape is the best editor for. So of course you're going to use Inkscape to do most of your logo, at least the final stages, right? Right. But then, aside from the, some of those other things, uh, developers especially have to get aware that there are many different styles you could use for your logo. You, you want to find the one, like I mentioned, Tux Paint, very child-oriented. There, but there's other, even variations within that that you can do to make things appropriate for your market if you know what you want. So first of all, you have to make sure it's within the constraints of what's appropriate for your target demographic. Then you have to decide on a style that you like as an individual first, then as an organization, you want to have at least buy-in from your main participants, your collaborators. If you're a one-man effort, you are it. So you get to run the shop. All right. But there are many, many different styles. And yes, that's my TTO. And what's interesting is I drew these from a slide I built on SVG. Every one of these is an SVG graphic. Every one of these I got from Open Clipart Library. By the way, that's a good resource, but you don't want to use Clipart as is and a few other things. But this is a good way to show, you know, there are a lot of styles. I don't want this style on my things, but, you know, some people might like that. Or actually, I bet in a year from now, I'm going to find some project where that is just the most appropriate type of style, and I'll, then I'll have to eat my words and actually do it. But there are many different, and that one at the center. I like this guy's stuff. It's so simple and fun and silly, and there's, he did a whole lot of animals on uh, open clip art, so you, you, know, you can get some good examples of the difference. So knowing some of the concepts and principles, we're going to pause first real quick. Were there any questions coming up through that area? Anyone? No. I'm just going too fast and mumbling and no one's hearing anything. Okay. Time to start thinking about putting it into practice. How does one put it into practice? How do you put it into practice some of the things designers do, at least the initial things to get you going? So, how many people checked the wiki and saw the preparation and did everything for the, this tutorial? Two, three, five, okay. So, of course, you're all set. So, let's get moving into preparation. There we go. Now, everyone brought up? Okay. All right. Okay, get your canvases out. You do, ha you do have your icon canvases, right? Okay. Well, first of all, this is, this is a little, you know, some people like to work like this, some designers. But here's the problem, specifically here, is this tool going to work for me? <laughs> it's, it's, there, are, uh, there are a couple styles that will actually work with these tools together. The pro hat style might work. style, So, this is, just an illustration that for many styles, this is an inappropriate tool match. But for a few styles, it is very appropriate. And we're going to look into that. But, did, no, did anyone bring a special hat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, bring out the hat. Uh, Can't oh, reach it. All right. Oh, good. So we have just a minute, taking pause for silliness. Very important. We have two people I notice with appropriate hats. 
So you win the icon canvases. More, more so than a few others. But appropriate, that's a good word, because that's going to move us on into the next thing. So now, time for practice. Tutorial session. You get to do something. And I get to take a pause and have another drink of soda. The task at hand is to pick the project, or aka your customer. Get something in your mind. If you look like you're trying to hide, I'll probably look at you and stare at you when I ask for hands. But you know, take a couple minutes, look around, plan something, or just a minute. Try to figure out, and I will ask for a couple of people to tell me what they're thinking of for this. So. Do, do, do. Little pause while we have thinking going on. I'm not seeing any smoke, so that's good. Brains. Okay, does anyone have an example of the, their target customer they figured out that they want to share? Oh, an art gallery proprietor. That's, that's a good one. Um, so you're going to want to convey to them the appropriateness of your solution. So that's, is it only there? And start thinking, is this the, your first customer or is, it, is there a general field that you might accidentally exclude by getting too narrow at first? So is it only an art gallery or is there more to it than that? Uh, art connoisseur. Artist, art patron of the arts, or only a gallery. When, you know, what's they appropriate? Teach, no. They teach paintings. Or they teach art uh, appreciation for the of painting. Ah, so we, uh, a refinement was mentioned of teaching art, also. So then you get a little more. Oh, you have an overlap. You have an intersection. Looking at that, and as you're thinking about this customer, you figure out who you're going to try to address today. But as you're doing that, think of you know, just next year or a couple years down the line, who might also be interested, be appropriate? That's a good question because you know, we don't narrow down to that future yet, but just don't paint yourself into a corner now. Then in part of practice, you want to try to use the right software. Now, is anyone familiar with Maslow's axiom? Which basically is, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you see every problem as a nail. And screws really don't like being slammed that hard. <laughs> so you want to use the right software for the, pre for the job. You need to practice. Practice in the different means. So at the first stop, the top practice is practice of how, do, how does one implement these steps? What is the process one goes through? This practice is the do it, do it again, do it over and over. This is important. Uh, for example, is anyone here a professional or semi-pro uh, casual weekend wedding kind of photographer? Yeah. Here's the question. If, if you're going to have to deliver five shots, to the customer at the end. How many do you need to take? Yeah, 20 or more. I've heard uh, uh, some of my friends who are into photography tell me they end up usually going for, if they need, for every one shot they need to have, they end up, they want to have a good shot, they have to take at least 10. And these, these are the guys who are going out every weekend at least taking pictures wherever. I see groups that are photo tours where guys will just get together on the weekend or in the morning before work with other people interested in photography, walk around and take pictures and then discuss it. Practice, repetition. Uh, practice over and over. But incorporating review, an analyzing it, feedback. You want to see, oh, I'm not getting these shots. Oh, I need a fill flash. You know, I'm not. I should turn my flash on always, even though it's daylight, because where I'm aiming, the, the details are being lost, because there's not light underneath. You know, little things like that. 
So you want to do it over and over. So now, your turn. Now, who here at least read the wiki on the preparation? One, two, three, four. Oh, good. At least a couple. Now, one of the things I mentioned in there was you need to bring, try to bring some drawing materials. Does anyone here not have a pen? One, two, three. Okay, yes. frowning at you. <laughs> you can ask a neighbor, you can try something else. Cell phone, maybe even you have a doodle app on there. That can work. Uh, but you don't need an artist sketchbook or anything like that. Here's the number one thing I suggested. <laughs> Cocktail napkins. It's amazing how much you can have done at the pub, after work. You know, just sketching out some rough ideas on here. So I am literally going to take five minutes to see anyone want paper, pens, doodle something. Hmm? The official cocktail napkin to design the world on. What was it? I think the original debiting packaging was designed on a cocktail napkin. <laughs> had had the, one of the guys who did that tell me last night. As we the do the original that. design for what became the uh, um, deflate compression algorithm was designed on one, mm -hmm. as well as UTF-8. Yeah, so deflate uh, compression and UTF-8 were also done that way. Uh, yeah, it's Picasso's piece of. Hmm? Pardon? Picasso's piece of. Oh, Picasso doesn't count. He does whatever yeah. he wants. <laughs> that was just on a but yes, so, so real artists also do this. So the idea is not to be a good artist, not to be able to draw, not to be able to na nail this down, but just to get something down on paper or the screen, wherever you're, you're comfortable sketching. Can you one of those napkins, please? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> sure. Anything in your mind. Anything you feel like doodling, you don't have to show anybody at all. Part of this, though, is if you're going to be doing this, you want to get used to doodling on the computer, doodling on whatever medium you decide is going to work for you. So you ought to try a couple. But then just get used to it. Do it a few times. So, you know, try it. If it doesn't work, try something different. Try a few different styles, and something just might click. If not, well, just practice some more and talk to some people and get some feedback. So, doing this. I'm going to try something. Just as an example. Now, by the way, this graphics tablet costs a few hundred dollars, so if you're not into it, this might not be the right thing. Of course, this is Intuos. So if you're into, into the Intuos, it, this is a great tablet. If not, they have little consumer ones that go for under $100. I think I'll be close to be able to hacking the, the Nintendo Wii controller, 3D, or dra simple graphic tablet that sells. So it's for $50 now, but they might be gone in a while. I don't know. There's a bamboo. Yeah, the bamboo is the Wacom line for the... Yeah. Yeah, the bamboo and Intuos work well right out of the box. Latest Ubuntu, just plug it in and they run. And let me see if... Oh. Oh yeah, is that Peter? Peter yes, Peter Hutter is the Linux guy who's done the tablet work. He's great. 
Yeah, so if anyone has problems with a tablet or a device, help him out and he'll get there. So, I don't know. Let's see. I'll try to think of an artist. It's like, it's kind of ugly. But, uh, let's see, I can, uh, I catch that and you know you might like to work in color you might like black and white oh got it and it's like eh, I don't know if I like that so throw away the paper, scribble it up. Well, it's, it's helpful actually to keep a lot of doodles, a lot of designs around because you never know as you're working. You know, and, and, you know in this case, I'm just trying to throw out a couple things. I'm starting to get, well, when I w was trying to draw an easel, being not a good quick sketch or not practice at sketching, uh, kind of looked like I ended up with an A in there. And I kind of think, oh, for art, and maybe there's something about that. Or, you know, trying to think of something simple and abstract. Uh, reminds me of another aspect. Books, books, books. I like books. Ew, that's ugly. I need to change my settings at some point. Oh, yeah. If it doesn't have pages, it's not a book. That looks kind of like a face with eyeglasses. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, a, that's kind of what I'm trying to show you, is that even if you're not practiced in drawing, you can, if you start doodling, start just, I mean, throwing up all these things, you go, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so like here, I, I, I start to think, oh, that reminds me of something else. Like, this is a face, or... Th these aren't pages. These, this is a guy's hair behind it. You know, so maybe I might want to go. Oh, huh. well, let me try a variation on that. You know, like like that book or magazine, and of course, someone reading will have glasses, and he has wild hair because he's not conservative or business guy. You know, and, and now we're starting to get close to something for one of the styles, you know, something slightly swooshy and calligraphic and are abstract. You know, you get to, and this is kind of what you all you, you have to do when you, you're trying stuff. If you're afraid to try it, go and go by yourself somewhere. Do it. But like I said, I've had so many people tell me that anyone can draw. And I was surprised after I started taking art classes in college to supplement my computer stuff, only because I love 3D and they had a computer animation program that mixed computer classes with traditional art classes. I was like, wow, I'm a programmer, but I can pick up a lot of these techniques. And if you just keep following in the techniques, maybe you're not quite going to be Picasso, but you can definitely do a lot better than this. <laughs> I'm, I'm intentionally out of practice and not doing much with these here. So, you know, just doodling around. Now is the point where I'm going to try something on the fly to see if it works. And if it doesn't, great. Although I wasn't stupid enough to upgrade my OS just before I came here. I did it a week ago to learn some of the problems, and I did get them.
One, two, three, you're still doodling. I'm not watching you, right? Okay. So as you're doing this, especially if you're going to end up on the computer, how are you going to clean it up? Well, just throw it on your high-res flatbed scanner that all good artists have and scan it in, right? Uh, who here has a flatbed scanner at home? Oh, looks like you know half to two thirds. Ah, uh, and he's got two people have thrown out. Yeah. So nowadays, I find a really good alternative to having a scanner is just even a very simple webcam. Like I have here, just a little tiny uh, 640 by 480, bought it in the, the clearance bin of my local office store in, for $5. So let me try. Yes, I was going to bring up, someone just mentioned mobile phones. Those cameras are actually getting very good nowadays. Some of them are much better than the point and shoots you used to get digitally. And you know, you can do your, you can do your banking off of them. So I'm going to go and bring this up while you're finishing up some of your efforts. Um. Wow, that's working. So all I have is this dinky little cheap little webcam. Point it down at my effort. See if it will autofocus. And if yeah, yeah. This is actually the one that had a problem at one point, needed to be unplugged and plugged back in. But the point is that it can do this. At some point in time. Yeah. But if not, the, the main point is you get an idea. There we go. Bingo. So yeah, the, the point of having enough contrast. So I just scribbled some stuff on there. Now, one of the things people used to do is use non-repo blue pencils. They had special pencils that were a special blue color that photocopiers wouldn't pick up. So you do your rough sketching in that, and then you use black pencil afterwards to put in your, your big thing. But you don't need that. Just take a picture, bring it into uh, your space, and there you go. And now as I return to the tutorial in progress, So this is where we were. You were drawing something. Does anyone have anything they want to show? Sure. Sure. So I'm trying to come up with a uh, logo for a mm -hmm. test suite for the BIOS. So. so the first thing that came to mind was the classic, you know, modify a microchip to look like a bug, because that's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to find. And then I'm looking for some way to look at it, like a microscope, or that seems too complicated. So I'm with a magnifying lens, but that mm -hmm. seems too much like search. Yeah. So trying to find for a um, debugging process, c coming up with a bug, mi microscope, 
debugging yeah, exactly. thing. So I've and got something vaguely like that, which... Yeah, can I sure, throw it up on screen? It. So, and this is another thing, is that if you have some physical media like this, how are you going to bring it in? Nowadays, I think cell phone is probably going to give you the best overall quality. But... Let's bring back up the webcam. And see if your contrast is a little better than mine was. Yeah. Yeah, so we see some stuff starting to come together there. And the good thing is that you did a whole bunch of rounds, you, you're just throwing things out. Can you, can you, put, you know that blue thing that you've got there? Yes. I was just saying here, if you going to take an image, if you put that blue thing over the top of it, it'll, it'll focus along the edge of that relative to the paper, and you'll get fairly good. Uh, yeah, I was just, yeah. Not quite running the pic picture yet, so. But that was part of it, is you just start doodling, working on, Different. You might get an idea, you might get variations, a couple on, or you might suddenly trip over a different theme, like the, you know, the, the bug where, oh yeah, it's a computer chip bug, and the magnifying, or the microscope, or is it a magnifying glass, or other variations like that. So we had the idea of practice. In this case, do it. You just have to do it over and over. And then you will start to get better. Try things. If you don't try it, you don't know when you'll make it. Next up, check your pre-done research. Did anyone here do any research and save it? Anyone? Anyone want? Good. Okay. That's a good idea, especially in general, when you're going to be working on something, even if you have good connectivity at home and all that, because here, well, if you didn't have anything saved to your hard drive, you have to hope the Wi-Fi keeps working. And as a conference goes on and on, it starts to go down more and more and gets slower. Things like that. So you want to you know, do web searches, image searches, whatever. Whatever you find, save the pictures you find the, you know, use the browser to save the web page all together and make sure you save the link so you make a note of where you hit because the ne even a day later you may not remember how you got to something and they had other stuff you wanted to see. So you want to keep that up. Um, and then you want to research often and again practice. And also, <laughs> practice. <laughs> now that's a good thing. So let's go back, going back a bit though, um, to research. What, I'm, what am I talking about here? I'm going to try to flip over, attempt to bring up a browser and have it do my will here live on stage. How many people think that's going to work? Oh, I'll be fine. Let me just close my mail, close that, close that. So, if I just a moment. Um, There is something I did, which... So, what we have is some research I did months ago for the logo I was working on.
Oh. Hold your input device the right way up. It helps. Yeah, this is <laughs> jaunty angle. This is this is this is one of the things I like. This input device. This works for me, um, and I, I've even used this to run presentations because it's much easier for me to do certain things this way than to have a little click, 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 click that I don't feel I have control over. Whereas here, I know forward, back, forward, back. I'm not going to get it wrong because I have to go all the way. But anyway, there was a project I'm working on that's a collaborative uh, share resources between different graphic applications called Viaduct. So we took some brainstorming and Scribus guys and I were tossing things around and then I came up with Viaduct and it was like, oh yes, that's it. That's the name for the project. Okay, so that was the first round, the brief. Okay, so the brief was, I'm going to be targeting people who might use graphical applications on the computer, including graphical professionals who are used to the Adobe suite. Okay, there's my definition. Anyone who might use it. That's pretty broad though. And it's connecting them and the idea is the road tying them together. The, the viaduct is the Roman built up bridges to span the gap and get roads across places you normally couldn't. So viaduct was the thing. And I started, I, I had some images in my brain. And so I went searching and then I found this place that has a lot of, from the ordnance survey, that had images that I was free to use in the way I wanted to use them. So I could grab these, look at them, use them for reference, and not be violating anyone's copyright. We should all be very respectful of that, especially because we're trying to come up with something that could be artistic. We want people to respect us. So it's, so just a, even all things of the law aside, it's just common courtesy. Between Wikimedia Commons and some of these other places now, you can find a lot of resources. So in this case, I found this, this image I really liked in one regard because this span in the middle started to fail so they reinforced it and suddenly they turned that one arch into the letter A. And if viaduct, the keyword is via, which is the movement, so A. So I was thinking, oh, maybe I could do a V or an I and an A, you know, VIA, and that's a good way to do an A. I explored that a little, we ended up not doing that. But I had that as a reference to suddenly give me some thought, food for thought to move forward. And I liked the way, and I, by referencing I could say, oh yeah, uh, these get wider as they go near the bottom. Okay, that's a stylistic thing I might be able to use. Here's another one, I really like the angle on this shot for the chapel viaduct. Uh, here's a, a pretty impressive looking one. But these weren't quite what I was going for. Even this Thornton. This started to get closer to what I had seen in my mind, but there was an idea of a nice curved arc one that was turning that I thought would make a really nice logo. And then I found it's the Glenfinnan viaduct. That is exactly what I was thinking. I, well, I saw this picture and I'm like, oh, this is about it. Let me keep searching. Maybe somebody took another picture of this and they did, and that, that was exactly what was in my mind when I started. As I refined it and got the idea and worked through, this came into my, well, not quite when I started, but it came into my mind and I was able to find a reference that showed me in real life. Now, how many people remember the, uh, the elephant picture I showed? Yes, most, good. Simplicity. I, I don't want to actually copy this. I'm using it for inspiration to say, okay, a viaduct and, and this beautiful, and, and how this is going off and, oh, that, that is proof of thought, very beautiful. Unfortunately, as I started trying to rough this out and do it, it wasn't coming together because what I was doing was too complex. So I started looking at and then I remembered, well, what else can I do to bring it in? And then I said, oh, the letter. What letter? V. Okay, that's memorable. Not many other things are using the letter V. And so let me search. And so I knew a couple places to look. One of the favorites I have is a place called From Old Books. Is anyone familiar with that website? There's a person who's worked with the W3C who is just into preserving illustrations and wood, woodcuts. 
and he's scanning them at high enough resolution for them to actually be preserved and work. And so I went looking there, and I found this. After searching through a few alphabets, I was like, oh, beautiful. So that gave me a lot of food for thought, especially these wheels. I was thinking pulleys and gears, and you could do all sorts of things. But if nothing else, this shape, this is a nice V. And um, oh, look at that. Public domain. Because these are old books. Very important. You know, be a, and you don't want to use clip art to symbol into your thing, because then it just looks like assembled clip art. So given all that, that's what I ended up. So just I wanted to give an idea of what I meant when I was saying research. Got an idea, tried to get some references, and with the web, you can do that. And I tried to make sure anything I was really going to pull down was appropriately licensed, and I wasn't infringing on anybody's rights or preferences. And there I go. So. Does that bring me back? Ah. So now. Okay. So pre-done research. Another thing, why would you need to do save your research? Pre have it pre-done before you want to even talk to other people or just save it in general? Does anyone have an idea? It could disappear in the meantime. Most if I go back to my browser and check links I bookmarked six months ago, some of them are gone. Two years ago, a lot. Or what happened yesterday? Wiki, Wikipedia itself was gone. Well, if you knew what you're doing, you could get around it. But in general, they, they blacked out for a day. But I had completed, just before they went black, I completed all those saving of additional images I wanted to do, so it was perfect timing. Because I, could, I then took a screenshot of that so I could show other people. You guys here know what I'm talking about, so I don't need to show you. But I can show other people if I need to give them this information. So, you know, you're going to get stuff disappearing. So, and then if you want to research often. Because come back in a week, it'll sink down into your brain and you'll see new things or try different ideas. And suddenly you'll trip over the one thing like I did when I hit the Glenfinnan viaduct and it just went boom, that's it. Practice also, practice. Okay, so let me skim back. Okay, so now we're going there. Who noticed what I was sketching in? Inkscape, right? Good. So what do we have there? That's SVG, vector graphics, that's what you want to end up with. And that is really good. Um, <clears throat> I'd say you want to look at, we'll probably jump back and forth through this a lot. My, my, oh, by the way, my intention is for you to be able to download the slides and go over this yourself at home, because what did I say you need to do? Practice. 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 So these are a few things to do when you try it. Look under the help menu on Inkscape. It's actually helpful. It's amazing how many people come into the IRC room asking for help. Help, help, how do I use this? Did you check the help menu? No. Unlike other programs, it's actually useful. There's, there's even a, one of the tutorials is on the principles of design. Guess what? It's what they thought anybody off the street who's never gone to art school might need to know to get them off on the right foot. Very helpful. And then there's one tricky thing. If you go to save bitmaps, you want to export bitmap, not save as ping. Because there's a weird thing, the way it's been implemented, the, the save as was added later and doesn't have the options that preserve transparency, among other things. And you like that. Uh, who here is familiar with GIMP or Krita? Most everyone, good, yeah. Photo painting. Some people prefer ve working in vectors. Some people prefer working in pixels. Painting. That's fine. If that's what works better for you, you can do that. Then just bring it into something and vectorize it afterwards. That, that's a good, easy thing. And here's a quick thing. 
how do you practice? Just create a little 40 by 40 image, scribble, save it. Then view it large in your favorite in your image viewer or web browser and hit Control Plus. It works in rasters, pixels. So each little dot, as it go, blows up, gets big and square and blocky. You don't get that with vector images. And then I mentioned using the webcam to grab your images or your cell phone, whichever one is easiest for you. Sometimes working with the cell phone, you can get a really nice picture. But if you don't need that or if it's just easier, sometimes just having the webcam sitting up, clip to a frame, and you can maybe often go into the software and just say acquire from cam or something like that. Pulls straight into your, your program. Then you can clean up the image there and you know, erase the lines you don't want, bring up the contrast because you notice how bad a problem the, the digital recognition had for trying to focus when it couldn't, didn't have enough contrast. The tra ve vectoring, Inkscape will vectorize a bitmap. You import a bitmap, select it, and say vectorize, and it will convert it into vectors. And that's another uh, good thing to try. Oh, can you edit how it interprets the vectors? Yes, that's one of the things. Um, I'm not sure. I'll have to see how we're doing on time for me pulling it actually in and running through. But Inkscape, yeah, Inkscape has a lot of options. We use the PO Trace software to do the actual tracing, but then we layered up multi-pass tracing and other algorithms and tuning parameters. And so, if you use Inkscape to do the tracing, it gives you a lot of options. So. Often, if it's a bad image, I'll just clean it up a little in GIMP, save it out, bring it into Inkscape, trace it there. If the trace didn't, sometimes I'll just try it straight, and if the trace works fine, I'm good. If not, I have to go back to GIMP, clean up the noise and the dirt and whatever else, and then bring it back in. And then, who's familiar with Scribus? One, two, three, four. Four, four people here, five. Okay, not, not bad. So Scribus is professional desktop publishing quality software for putting stuff together. Inkscape and GIMP are good for creating a resource, creating an asset. You need an illustration, do it in Inkscape. You need a photo cleaned up, do it in GIMP or Krita. Uh, there are a couple others, but the, technically, I think Krita and GIMP give you a bit more in control than some of the other systems. Some of the other software is good for painting approach, things like that. If you're into digital painting, that might end up, some of those might be the best ones for you. But then you bring it in to Scribus, and Scribus puts it together in what you're publishing. That's good for if you're going to do flyers, um, posters sometimes, books. That's what it does. It puts it together and makes it easy. So you could, like, you could maybe do a flyer or one or two in Inkscape, and that you're hitting at the upper limit of what is easy in that regards. But if you do a couple illustrations in Inkscape and then put it together in uh, Scribus, it's easy to do a multi-fold, several-page flyer or booklet or whatever you want at home or send out a professional quality PDF to be printed at your local copy shop or publisher. And those, it, it is a really good job. If anyone's ever heard of Quark Express or Adobe InDesign, this pretty much is in that same, replaces it. Personally, I think it's much better than Quark because it's easier and... A lot cheaper. Yeah, and a lot cheaper. <laughs> a lot, lot cheaper. And the guys, Scribus guys know what they're doing in, when it comes to print because they work in the print industry, a lot of them. So this is where we were going to look at some interesting things. <laughs> Can you break it? Yes. This is a key point. I'm going to point out that Scribus can import SVG, but not all of the SVG that Inkscape can create. So you want to try. You want to be careful. So let me drop out for a second and pull up Scribus. If it decides to play nice, another live demo in the middle. Scribus is touchy with fonts. If you try to 
well import fonts that are not. Oh, Scribus is touchy with fonts. Yeah, there's some of the things. It, it does professional, but it does it expecting things to be done well. So let me see. Is, again, hold the tablet the right side up helps. Uh, file. Now here's the interesting thing. Import. You can create an image box and then get an image which will get a bitmap. Or you can do the special menu item to get vector file. If you're doing a logo, you want to use it, you want it to be scalable. So you want to pull that in. Oh, Tux, he's our buddy. We like him. Let's pull him in. How does he, oh, what's this? This wants me to place it somewhere because it's all about layout and placement. There we go. He's all happy. And if I zoom in, he's all vector, so he's smooth edged. He'll print happily and all this other good stuff. Uh, I can move the page around. Let me get him out of there. But I said I wanted to see if we can break it, right? So can, can I? Uh, let's see. Import vector, not get image. That's the main thing. And, oh, let's try the UPS, because that was a pretty one. I like that one. That one looked really nice. I bet it would look good printed out on the full scale uh, poster printer we have, right? Uh-oh. Here's the first warning. If you see this, you know something's going to go wrong. Stribus will at least try to warn you. Sometimes it may not quite catch it and it will misinterpret something. But if you see this, it's pretty much a sign that it, yeah, it's going to for sure. Let's see how bad it is. Ooh. That, that just, oh. So this is the point where technically whatever you're doing in creating the logo, you want to keep this in mind and test it. Because if you try to send that to the printers and you didn't check, or you send it to somebody to drop it in and he doesn't know what it's supposed to look like, he may, the person putting it together for you in Scribus when they take your logo from your logo download page may think that's what it's supposed to look like because they don't know. If you haven't checked, you, so this is I think important and the Scribus team has been in improving their SVG import. At one point they were getting ready to drop it and say, oh, just make Inkscape export PDF. At the same point, the PDF library Inkscape was using was problematic enough that we were telling everybody, oh, yeah, our PDF isn't good, just, use, just import it into Scribus and use it to make it uh, your SVG into a PDF. So it's like, we convinced them not to drop their import and they've actually been improving it. But in this case, you go and you can figure out what features aren't supported and back up and not use them. Like in this case, it looks like they did a rectangle and just did a, applied a clipping shape. So they didn't actually cut it. They just say, pretend the rest outside of this path doesn't exist. Bring it into here. It's not recognized. So to this, the whole rec rectangle exists. So you can go back and tweak your graphics until they work. So knowing what, when your file goes out to others, what it will do is important. This is part of the support aspect I mentioned at the end of the one design. Oh, the uh, question was, did I say SVG was a standard? Yes, SVG is the W3C's standard for s vector graphics. It's, in fact, it's had been on the back burner because Microsoft participated originally and promised to support whatever was decided. And when their proposal wasn't adopted, they took their ball and went home. After years, the, things swirled around and us who were promoting uh, SVG adoption got, gained enough traction so that we got it got to the point where people start using it more and more and more and then suddenly Adobe moved away from using it so uh, Microsoft could come back and support it again and all sorts of weirdness but the interesting point is in the last year or so it got picked up among other things as part of HTML5 so that gave it a big push and then Microsoft came back to the table and said Okay, it's a standard. We're trying to support HTML5. It has SVG as part of that. Let's try to do good SVG. And I'll have to say, the guys involved from Microsoft worked really hard communicating with us in the communities, 
submitting a lot of bug tests because basically it looked like they were really coding hard to make this stuff work. And so now every single major browser supports this. Opera, um, Safari, Conquer, Firefox, Internet Explorer all support SVG in the browser. Oh, if it's not a standard, only because the people coding this were focusing on other parts of standards. So SVG is a standard, but they just haven't implemented all of it to yeah, answer that question. Email. Yeah, so they have a subset of it. But so Scribus' focus is on doing professional PDF output. Then as they have time, they apply things to other areas. And then this type of thing, if you're a good designer, you, you'd create it in Inkscape or, some other, or Illustrator or something. You come into Scribus. You import it. If it breaks, you go back and undo, you know, clean up the parts that broke until it works. So let's. Skim forward to can you break it? And then the point I was I was making about save and then export to PDF. Two different things. Scribus has its own native format, but then when it creates a PDF, it has all the it has it it's the equivalent of assembly language programming. It will let you do everything. If you need nice control over all your PDF, it will give it to you. So this is important there. And, and to try it to get the right level of PDF support, different Adobe viewer versions are different, different print shops support different levels of that. Go back and play it. Then another thing to do when you look at it is to try to find out about the color management in CMYK. If you're going to a print process that use it, that's important. Uh, also, if you place the same image multiple times, you created a logo, does it look good small? Does it look good big? Does it look good over black, over gray, over white? Middle gray, that one often really kills people. Things like that. So try it. And then, okay. So now, are you ready for the big secret in the practice of actually doing this? Anyone ready? Okay. Ready for the big secret? You want to leverage designer help. Leverage the designers out there that you might come in contact with or your group. How would you do that? Basically, it's hard to just ask some professional graphic designer to come in and do work for you for free from scratch. You know, just because you saw the whole process, all the different steps, the brief, the research, the re refinement. They may not want to do that. So it's much easier to get someone to help you just with the final refinement. If you've done all the hard work and you can say, here's my brief. Here's what we're trying to do. Here are some of the things we worked through, and this is where we're at. Isn't this beautiful? <laughs> Guess what? My trick. Often, what I create is not beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so out of pity, they will come in and fix it for me. You know, or they, they'll be able to see it and realize, oh, no, 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 no. That's not how you do that. I know what you're trying to do. That's not how to do it. Here, here, let me show you. This is how you do it. Because they, from their practice, they can recognize it. It's like when I look at bad code, if it's bad code, I can see it. It's, it might take me a couple minutes looking at it to figure out why, but I'll look at code and say, oh, something's not right here. Oh, wait a minute, you have to do this. You forgot to initialize over here. You're using your iterator outside of the loop over there. You know, same thing. Or someone mentioned you might challenge them. Say, look at how good my thing is. Isn't this great? I bet you couldn't do this good. <laughs> But of course, in that case, definitely be tactful and considerate because you really don't know. And number one thing, you want to play for the long term. You want to have collaboration. You want to bring designers into open source because next quarter, maybe he'll join your marketing team to help promotion of your group. And then, since he knows you will work with him and you try, that's the thing. Often, a designer won't want to work for you for free, but if you try, they appreciate the effort. It's like, okay, at least you're trying. Okay, I can help. 
you, you, that, that's a sad effort. I'm, but here, let me, let me, you go back and code, you're good at that. I'll, let me do what I can do. So in some of that, when I first presented the viaduct idea, I was, asked, I was at a conference that was half programmers, half graphic designers and artists. And I presented this, oh, by the way, we're working on this project. And oh, and one my final point, oh, I just need some help on the logo because I need someone to help me design a logo because I just have this for now. Can anyone tell me what's bad about this? It's Comic Sans. <laughs> uh, Comic Sans. So about a quarter of the audience got it and said, wait a minute, is it that? Oh, no, Comic Sans, the most hated font in the graphic design world. Most loved by education institutions, even those of higher learning, often. Oh, by the way, but notice, what's this I put on the middle here? TBD, to be determined. I watermarked it so no one can actually take this image and use it without implying that no, this is not the final. When I showed this here to a group of people, people here only noticed that it was TBD. They did not notice that it was Comic Sans <laughs> or a bad logo. Well, maybe they knew it was a bad logo and didn't say anything just to be polite, but the programmers will notice the TBD. But graphic designers will notice that and go, oh, no. So then I, didn't, I didn't, then I did my research. So you saw what I did because I was thinking of a graceful curve and maybe the word viaduct in that curve. And, but that got to be too complex, too much. But I still like the idea of the arched representation and the fonts. So I came up with my 1.0, which is a little bit of an effort probably needs refinement and I'm sure the graphic designers out there will help me replace it or improve it but then this is what I got so combining and I have the files I can throw up for how I got this but I've gotten a few layers I did the, the letter by itself a bridge by itself. I put in a photo and scaled it to fit as a reference so that I could do it and then I put in Inkscape, did it, just did a couple points and then I just physically grabbed one of the dots pulled it down grabbed another pulled it down Easy, easy for me to do. And then suddenly I've got something that at least isn't as ugly as that last one. At least this is I, hopefully simple, memorable. It doesn't actually say what my software does, does it? But it can represent our project, our group, our effort. And that's another thing. You want to, hopefully this is timeless. I don't see any Nyan cats dancing around in it or anything like that. Then again, for some markets, that would be an appropriate logo, but because it is a simple thing. And then on this, as I mentioned, the, I have the files with the breakdown on the construction. I can put those up online to be available, or if you catch me after, I can show you the construction I use. And then as we go forth, it's going to be your turn. Pull on these programs. It doesn't cost anything. Unlike Adobe where you have to drop a couple grand to get a really powerful collection of InDesign and everything else. You know, you, and it doesn't cost you anything to try. A little time, little doodle. You might discover, even if nothing else, maybe you like it. Maybe it's just fun to do little things in the margin. So I'm going to ask for questions in just a moment. But first, I was going to give, I have a whole bunch of references up here. Many of these are how to design a logo, and you notice some are how not to do it. These have some really good, uh, maybe I don't agree 100% with all of these, but between these they cover a lot of the basics, a lot of the stuff you need to get going. Some of these others, design tips. Bottom line, I wanted to point this out though. Books. These books I had recommended to me tell, from someone saying that anyone can learn to draw. And this was Dave Crossland, if you know Dave. So yes, he has a, um, I think it's a master's in font design or whatever official thing is related to that. But so he's a, someone who's been trained, who's experienced, who is good. And he said, yeah, those, those books are great. You want to get them the, in order of needing them, by the way. If you only get one, just get the first one. But I think it's like only 10, 10 or $12 for the paperback. Uh, who knows as Amazon comes down here. but I. I don't know if Amazon was showing me local prices or not, but you know that it's not 
that bad to get going and they can help you get going. And then of course one of the final things when you do logo design you want to have it talk to your lawyers in some way and get your right statements so you can do things like this to say registered, used, you know, these people own those designs so I'm not going to try to rep misrepresent my business or my association, you know, all that. And so then we can back up now and see if there are any questions here at the conclusion. Has anyone got any questions for John? We have 10 minutes to fill. You can think of something. I just thought I'd mention um, one stage I had to um, do some guidelines for my work and um, I used a program called Lix which is like a front end for um, LaTeX and I, I had a lot of trouble getting things I'd created in Inkscape into Lix so I um, tried a program called Dyer which mm -hmm. I did some logos and things in that and they were really tiny and I saved them as EPS format and, and that worked very well for, for logos. So I just thought I'd mention that. Yeah, so that's another thing. Um, Dia, I'm aware of, is really good for diagramming flowcharts and other things, but sometimes, technically, if Inkscape or some of these others are giving you some problems, going into these other alternatives is a good one. And then exporting like EPS might be a good format for many uses. And to know, know your target audience, know what it's go system it's going to end up in is important. It's more of a sort of, I, I bumped into John uh, yesterday, Okay. it was, uh, when you were looking at the OLPCs and explaining to him that my daughter, who's um, in primary school, the eldest child, I had to do a project and it had to be about uh, visiting somewhere in Australia, whether you'd been there or not. So she did Magnetic Island where we'd been and we did the whole thing uh, in uh, Scribus and then uh, had it printed and it was a, a, uh, one of those tri trifold, you know, threefold things. And I had to actually end up going into school and explaining to the school that I'd sat there and explained her how to use it, but she'd done it. But this was software that anybody could have and then took DVDs in so they could all have it because the teacher was suspicious that she'd actually got somebody to do it. And it was somebody who was quite advanced in all of this and it seemed quite professional. Uh, what I didn't tell John was um, the Sydney Linux user group had a stall uh, two years back. This happened. So she was eight at the time. Uh, at the Education Expo for New South Wales. And I took this with us as an example of what you can do with free and open source software. And p everybody goes around showing what they've got and going from stall to stall. Now we had people coming up to us who were charging services, who were showing their brochures. And so we started asking them how they'd developed them. And when we showed them ours, they were asking, this is my daughter's, how much did it cost to get it done? And there's, they'd had these things done which would I'm not an artist. I'd I did some fine art at uni, but that's the extent of my ability. My daughter's probably draws better than I do. But with really, really, with, with things that are free and a bit of effort, they turned out far better than things that people who were producing their own had done and quite expensive software. And I was looking at them thinking, why did you bother? <laughs> what was the point? So this, and, and I'm not a, uh, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. So we just struggled our way through and looked at the help files and see what people had said. And it, they're really interesting. Inkscape and, mm -hmm. and uh, Scribus are fantastic. And I'm not a, like, an artist by any stretch. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, well, one minor point on Scribus on the follow-up. There is a good book on Scribus written by two of the core members of the team. Uh, and that book, I believe, is available online in electronic form, in wiki format, so you can get that research if you want to get, or resource, if you want to get up to speed on it, that's a really good point. But again, that's a um, really good point and helps you move forward. Yeah. Thanks, John. That was really, really useful. Um, this is a little bit sideways. Can you talk a little bit about um, SVG fonts in Inkscape? You can say no to that question. SVG fonts in Inkscape follow up with me because there's a whole... Things are a bit fluid in the whole web world right now on whether or not they want to support it. And there are a few people who are doing a lot of good stuff. And we have Tavion Ba who has been doing a lot of our font work. He's heavily involved in the W3C now working group and doing a lot. And 
we can probably that is a in, in general that's a really good question to ask but I, I'm aware enough that it has been changing so much in the last couple months that we, we want to get the latest details okay. I just I, I think I have some uh, bra um, bragging rights here I actually managed to get some of my code into the the book you mentioned I, I did a bit of um, I did some experimenting with uh, PDF forms where you could um, you actually put JavaScript inside PDF forms with Scribus and uh, you can do some quite clever things with um, coding in um, Scribus like you can um, e just email information rather than the whole form and then at the other end um, the information gets put back into the PDF so you can get tiny files with a lot of information being emailed. So there's some quite clever things that you can actually do. Although I haven't quite worked out, uh, Adobe seems to have blocked some of the features in the PDF. So you can't, you can't do everything. And the, the other thing I was quite puzzled with, there was all these features in uh, Scribus that you could do, but the programmers never seemed to be aware that it could do these things. And I couldn't quite get my head around how you could program a program mm -hmm. and yet don't know it had all these features. Well, that one I, I know the answer to. Some of these programs are so large and different people work in different areas of them that they're not aware of the whole system. And then another thing is sometimes you're using these support libraries that have added features as they go and you didn't know that they added it, but since you're calling the library the way it was intended, you get any improvements they gave you for free. And then suddenly, th combining with the other libraries and your own code, you get the ability to do more that you don't even know. And that, that's very common. Or in some cases, they've coded it so many years ago, or I've done this too, you've coded something so many years ago, you forgot that you can actually do that until someone tries to use it. So. A lot of these systems are just fun and interesting to discover. That was great. Uh, has anyone else got any questions? None at all? <laughs> One quick. I've seen these QR codes everywhere, but I haven't actually found out how, how you make a code like that. Oh. Yeah, there's an, ink, there's an Inkscape extension that will do these now. There's a couple of websites that you can just Google the QR code generator and some of them will give you all sorts of options including the pixel size and what information you want to include. Oh, of course, there's a Pure module for it. There's a module for everything. <laughs> all right. Okay, any more questions? Nothing at all? Okay, well, on behalf of the conference team, I would like to say thank you very much for oh, your time. Thank you. Thank you. Can everyone give a round of applause?